Did you know that the Gospels focus more on the last week of Jesus than the rest of the whole 33 years of his life? 33 years of life, and most of the Gospels are all centered around the last seven days he was alive. It's amazing. Um, one, one third of the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, one third of those books were all written about the last week Jesus was alive. And then the book that we'll be talking about today, the book of John, half of the entire gospel is on the last week of his life. On the last week of his life. It's, it's amazing to me uh, how much emphasis is put on this. The, the resurrection is the, the most important event, not only in Christianity, but in the event of the entire world. That's the most important thing that's ever happened in the history of, the, of our life, not our lifetime, the history of the world is this resurrection. And so that's why so much is dedicated to it. I don't know if you ever noticed that. One third of, of three of those gospels and half of this last one we'll be talking about. So let's talk about it. John chapter 20. If you're in your paper Bible, then I know you holy, all right? You got your paper Bible here, or, you know, we got it on the screens for you. Plus, you can download the Version Bible app, and we've got some notes on there for you. Amen. I see you right there on an Android, probably. It's all good. It's all good. I mean, God can redeem you. It's all right. It's like, we're going to pray for you. I'm just, I'm just playing. All right. All right. That was too much attention. All right. All right. John chapter 20. Let's talk about this. This is going to be good. I, I hope you're excited for it. Early on, uh, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Now, now before we jump all the way into this story, I just got to tell you, I think the Bible's funny sometimes. I really do. I might be kind of offbeat. I'm probably a different kind of pastor than most. I'm either all serious all the time or uh, like ask the, ask the dream team about that, you know, when it's time to plan an event. I'm just like, oh, all serious all the time. Or I'm just having a, and nothing serious, all right? And you get, you get the latter. <laughs> you get the fun part. Um, but I, I feel like I'm either one of those two. And when I'm reading the scripture sometimes, it's just all funny. Like this whole story right here is like got some humor to it because God might know we needed to laugh a little bit. So just watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. Who's writing this? John's writing this. How's he talking about himself? The one Jesus loved. The one Jesus loved. Okay. Okay, John, I see you, bro. All right, I see what you're doing there. The one Jesus loved. That's how he refers to himself. He's a humble guy, apparently. And said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. <laughs> Both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter. It's like, come on, bro. Did you just get a new pair of shoes? Like, look how fast I am in my new shoes. He's like acting like my seven-year-old. Typical guy, right? Like, I, not only does Jesus love me more, but I'm faster than you. It's like, come on. What, why is this even in here? Probably some scholar will tell me why it's important that John's faster at running than Peter. But for now, I just think it's ridiculous. Okay, both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter. He bent over, looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who came way later, way later, was there late, was there very late, came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first. All right, we get it, bro. You're better. You're better than this other disciple. We get it. Like, what are you trying to, you trying to show us how good you are? The one Jesus loved, John, bro, chill. <laughs> You're crazy. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside and they saw and believed. Listen, this is the moment where they thought Jesus' body had been stolen, but they realized it's not been stolen. He actually got raised from the dead. We serve a living savior, one who did not stay dead, but came out of that grave. And now we get to live in that freedom. Come on, somebody say amen. I hurt myself. I'm so excited about this. He's alive. And that's why we celebrate this resurrection Sunday. He is risen. He's not dead, but that's that's it. That's the whole story of the resurrection. It's, it doesn't take that long to read it. It's, it's gone. It's done. So what I'm thinking about is, is what else is going on? This whole book, this book is not done. John is continuing to write. What's he writing about? That's it. I mean, the, the rest of chapter 20 and chapter 21 is devoted to something else. 
The, gospel, the other gospels do the same thing. It's actually very interesting. I, I've read all these gospel accounts of the resurrection, uh, of course, a bunch of times leading up to this message and over my lifetime, I don't know how many times, but I noticed something this year that stood out to me a little bit different and I wanted to, I wanted to hone in on it. I wanted to, I wanted to give like some credit to what the Bible is trying to teach us. It's, it's beyond this, this resurrection is that the appearances of Jesus after the resurrection gets way more scripture than the actual story of the resurrection itself. I think there's something really special about that. I think there's something really sweet about that. On the day of his resurrection, Jesus made at least five appearances and at least 10 appearances over the 40 days after his resurrection. I think there's something significant here for us. Now, before I begin sharing with you these appearances, I had this other thought. Um, because I think it's fun sometimes to put myself in scripture. I'm like, like, what if I was there? Like, what would it be like if I was in there? And you could do this too. We're going to try this together. But uh, who would you appear to first? If, if you were Jesus or if you just like got, got killed and were raised back from that, I, I know it's kind of bizarre to think about, but, but let's do it. Let's just have some fun. See, sir, it's like I was glad when they said, let's go to church because we're having a little fun in church today. Who would you appear to? Who would you appear to, to first? I mean, if, if it was you, who would you sneak up on? You know, like you dead, but they don't know you're not dead and you're about to appear to them. Who would you sneak up on? Who would you jump out of the closet and like, whoa, like scare them? Like, who would you rub it into? Like, am risen, son, what's up? Like, I don't think Jesus did that. But like, if there was somebody, you're like, I told you I was going to live. What's up? I told you. Didn't I tell you right there? Well, well, what about if you were Jesus though? Let's think about Jesus for a second. Like, who would you, like, if you had to write the end of the, the gospel yourself, who would you, I was thinking about this and I was thinking if I'm Jesus, I'm, I'm writing this. I didn't write it. Thank God. But I would probably appear to my mom. You know, the last time, you know, if I'm Jesus and his mother, Mary, last time they saw each other, he was beaten beyond recognition. He couldn't even be recognized. He was beaten so badly and, and it was a bad time. And so I'd probably appear to mom and say, I'm okay. I'm okay, mom. Everything's fine. Of course, if it was my mom, and I was at the front door saying, I'm okay. She probably pushed me like, what's wrong with you? You have me worried sick. Of course, I know she would say that because I've done that many times. And I show up. She thought I was dead. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and I actually was alive. And she's like, what's wrong with you? Take off her chancla. Whack me with that thing. <laughs> For gringos in here, a chancla is a sandal. It's a sandal. It's a sandal. And, uh, you know, I'm just saying, you know, like my mom, not, she, she, she's not Spanish. So she'd take off her Birkenstock. Whack me with that <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Mom, if you're watching right now, I love you. I love, I love making fun at your expense, but you give me permission to do that. So I love you. Amen. 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 All right. So there, I'll probably appear to mom say, mom, I'm all right. Everything's good. Everything's good. But then there's also Matthew's gospel that talks about this guy, uh, Governor Pilate, you know, the one who, the one who sentenced Jesus to die. Um, but Pilate, you, many people don't see this and recognize it, that Pilate had two other warnings that he shouldn't have done this. His wife came to him both times. Uh, the first time she said, I, I shouldn't do this. Leave this innocent man alone. That's one. And then she had a dream during Jesus trial. Pilate's wife had a dream, came to him, slipped him a note during the trial and said, I've suffered a terrible dream. And you should not put this man to death. This is not some ordinary guy. That's two. So if I'm Jesus, I roll up and say, that's three. What's up? I'm ready. You can't see me. I'm like translucent. I don't know. I don't know. I, I would. So that's like the first lesson for the family series. Husbands, listen to your wives. You don't know who's going to show up on your front porch if you don't. All right. Just saying right there. That's not, not, not good advice. All right. Don't, don't worry about that one. How about this one? How about this one? The Sadducees were a Jewish group during the time of Jesus. The Sadducees were a Jewish group, and they, they did not believe they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. They didn't believe it could happen. They didn't believe in that kind of miracles. They believed in, they believed in God. They were Jews. They, they, they feared the one true God. But they didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead. So if I'm Jesus, I might. Boo. I don't know. Which, what would you do? What would you do? Who would you appear to? Because I'm thinking about it like this. I'm thinking Jesus, he has the whole world at his disposal. He can appear to anybody he wants. But he didn't appear to them. He didn't appear to all of them, not in that order. In fact, the Gospel of John highlights three people that, that Jesus appeared to. And there's so much Oh, there's so much hope found in these people. I'm, I'm going to show it to you right now. I'm going to show it to you right now. Um, Jesus didn't appear to those. John's gospel had three people, those who, who were discouraged, those who were doubters, 
and those who are disappointed. That's what, that's what John's gospel highlights right there. The first person that, that Jesus appeared to was Mary, not his mother, Mary, Mary Magdalene, the one we read about already in chapter 20. And so let's just continue it on. And Mary, like many of us, could be feeling discouraged even right now, could be feeling a little heartbroken. But let's just see what the scripture has to say about it. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And I know that this Easter and everybody's dressed up good, everybody's smiling, everybody's feeling good. But on the inside, perhaps, there's some turmoil there's some stress, there's some anxiety, there's some brokenheartedness. The scripture is going to talk about this right now. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw the two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken away my Lord, she said. I don't know where they put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was him. She didn't know. She, she was so close to Jesus, yet didn't realize it. Isn't there some truth in that? That right when we need him the most, he could be closer than we even think. Some of you think God is dead or at least dormant when it comes to your situation. You've been calling out. You've been heartbroken. You're like, God, where are you? Feels like my prayers are hitting the ceiling. Like Mary, maybe you've lost hope. I have to tell you that Jesus cares when you're crying. He cares when you're crying. Maybe it's a family struggle. Maybe it's something in the family that's just broken down. I encourage you, come back next week. You're, there's going to be healing and hope found for you in that. Maybe it's a marriage struggle. So the, you're, with something with your spouse, it's just not lining up just the way that you hoped it would. And you've been praying, calling out, and you're like Mary. You just feel like, God, where are you? I thought you were supposed to do all these things, but where are you? Maybe it's a financial struggle. You've been, you've been believing God for that, that promotion, but all you get is bills instead and debt and you're struggling and finances have this way of eking into our lives and just destroying us from the inside out. Maybe it's some other kind of pain, but I want to tell you this, that when you cry, heaven notices. Even if no one else notices, heaven notices. God notices. Jesus notices. Many times it's just hard to see Jesus in the middle of our pain. It's just really hard. What I need you to know is this, Psalm 34, verse 18 the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And he saves those whose spirits are crushed. So if that's you today, I want you to know that there is hope. If you're feeling brokenhearted, if you're feeling drowned in your, in your problems, that's when Jesus makes his first appearances to a person who's heartbroken. His first appearance reminds us that when you're hurting, Jesus isn't as far away as you think. So look to him. Just let, let your heart see him. Let the eyes of your heart see him. Not unlike Mary, who didn't notice at first, but then came to see. If you're hurting, look for Jesus. Look for his presence. I mean, I got to tell you guys, I've been praying for the service for a really long time, <laughs> ever since last year. <laughs> Post-Christmas, I started thinking about this right now, because I knew that there might be some people here that need to hear this message. So I've been praying. I've been hoping that those, those of you who come can see him, can experience him, can experience his, his healing, his hope, and his presence. He's close to the brokenhearted. Look to him in your pain and in your hurt. Okay, that's number one. That's, a, that's good. That's good news already. But here's another appearance. Doubting Thomas. I mean, that's his name. It's Thomas the doubter. One of the disciples named Thomas who's forever associated with doubt. I mean, how would you like to have a nickname like doubting and then whatever your name is? Like, that's messed up. I had some messed up nicknames growing up that I can't even repeat in this room. It's okay. But it was just from my idiot friends in school. You know, they were just giving me nicknames and it didn't matter. But how would you like to be immortalized in scripture as a doubter? I would not like that. Does not sound fun at all. Okay, but doubting Thomas, that's, is, that's one of the people Jesus appeared to. Jesus appeared to a doubter. He appeared to a doubter. I mean, your doubts don't keep Jesus away from you. In fact, as we see right here, maybe your doubts are the very thing that are going to draw Jesus even closer to you. The doubts that you're experiencing, the doubt that you feel. I mean, you look around and you, everybody else all fired up. Everybody else singing these songs. I don't even know the words of these songs. Like, what's going on in here? Everybody's all worked up, clappy, clappy. Like, what's this? What's going on? You're looking around like, I don't know. Like, I need to see more. I have some doubts. I need to experience it. Everybody else gets it. What's wrong with me? Maybe you feel like, what's wrong with me? 
You see, Jesus appeared to other disciples before Thomas. Watch how it happened in John chapter 20, verse 24. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where his nails were, where the nails were, and put my hands at his side, I will not believe. (laughs) Man, you ever drawn a line in the sand about your faith? And say, I will not believe unless this happens. And you might think to yourself, well, that's a terribly faithless thing to do. That only, only, a, only a real heathen would do that. This is one of the 12 we're talking about. He saw it all. He saw the loaves. He saw the fishes. He saw walking on water. And he still, after all of that, was like, I am not going to believe. You would think. I think if I was there, you know, I would be a little bit more, but we don't know that. All we are seeing here from the pages of scripture is that Jesus appeared to a straight up doubter, someone who should have believed, someone who had every reason to know the goodness of God. He saw it all, yet he still had doubts. Hey, that makes this story even better for you and me. It does because your doubts won't keep Jesus away. In fact, it didn't turn Jesus away. It it draws him to us. Jesus loved Thomas so much that Jesus intentionally comes back just for him. Watch how it goes. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with him. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came in and stood among them, walking through a wall. If it was me, I'd be like, what's up? Jazz and Jesus. I'm not just kidding. Never mind. Never mind. And he said this. He said this. So he's looking right at Thomas right now. He said, peace be with you. And watch what he does. He said to Thomas, hey, this is what you wanted to see, right? Go ahead. Put your finger right there. Hey, I know you had doubts. Go ahead. Hey, go ahead. Reach out. Put your hands on my side. That's what you wanted to see, right? And it wasn't to rub it in. Jesus was showing up for him, for a doubter, for someone who needed to see. Jesus says, all right, I got you. (laughs) I got you. He did not say, wasn't three years enough? Didn't I do enough miracles before you? Jesus didn't get all mad at him, get all huffy puffy and, and, you know, take his robe and go, and get all hyped up. No, he, he said, Thomas, I see you. I see your doubts, and I'm here to prove you right. I'm here to prove myself to you. I'm here to show up for you. So I'm just here to, I want to tell you, he invites the doubter to reach out. He invites the doubter to reach out. Jesus knows all about your doubts. He's not offended. He actually understands. He's searching for you. And that second appearance reminds us that Jesus isn't bothered by your doubts. So reach out to him. Reach out to him. He's not bothered by your doubts. For those of you who are here and and still doubting, still considering, I invite you to just take the next step in your spiritual journey. Our our church is built around next steps. We're always talking about next steps. But I'm going to tell you something that I've told countless people for countless years. We've been doing this for a long, long time. We have this little phrase, and we, we invite people to do it all the time. Just give us one year. One year. All the life groups, just jump in. Just go through the growth track, join the team. Just show up on Sundays. Maybe that's where you're at. Maybe that's your next step. Just show up, just one year. And we've had person after person, some of our biggest leaders in the church now responded to that same call. Married now with the, their, their families all. It's like, it's amazing what God can do with someone who has doubts and just needs to be invited. Reach out. Go ahead. Taste and see that the Lord is good. He'll come to you. He'll, he'll prove himself to you. Like Thomas, maybe you'll never know unless you do. So I invite you, one year, just go all in. Come back for the next series. I mean, you have a lot more to gain than you do to lose, and you might just find something that you never knew you were missing in your life. The presence of God in your life, confidence, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all the things that we're all looking for so much. So this last one, this last one, probably my favorite, definitely my favorite, favorite character in the Bible. His name's Peter. Peter. Oh my gosh. I identify with this guy because he's a failure. I'm just saying. He was the one that 
that had it all together during the ministry. He was probably one of Jesus' favorite people. That's also why I identify with him. I'm just kidding. I'm just playing. I, I can't help myself, you guys. I can't help it. I just can't help it. But he's the one that let Jesus down the most. When it mattered most, Peter let Jesus down. It's, it's incredible. The one closest to Jesus, he failed. He denied Jesus three times right after he said, Jesus, I'm going to go to the grave for you. I, agape, love you. I love you unconditionally. I'll go to the grave. And Jesus said, no, no, I, I love your enthusiasm, Peter, but you, you really don't know what kind of love I have to give. You think you got it, but let me show you something. And he was shown. He denied Jesus three times. Jesus died on the cross. And how do you think Peter felt? Terrible, bad, devastated. So he went back to fishing. He's like, well, I was a bad follower of Jesus. I was a bad fisherman, but at least I can still catch fish every once in a while. So he went back to fishing, totally defeated. His disappointment was about as high as he could probably be. He felt ashamed. Let me just tell you that this disappointment is the gap between expectation and reality. Sometimes we expect better things of others. Sometimes we expect better things of ourselves. And then there's a gap between what really happens. Peter knew about that gap. But because God has foreknowledge, you, you can't disappoint God as much as you think you can. God knew that Peter was going to deny him. He tried to tell him, but, he, but Peter just wouldn't listen. God knew. He knew. He knew it was going to happen. He still loves us unconditionally. So many people think God is turned off by our failures. No, Jesus is searching for people who failed, who let him down. No, Jesus is searching for you. Your failures don't repel Jesus. They attract him to you. I'm living proof of that. Pastor with the past right here. Anybody doesn't deserve to be here, it's me. But I know firsthand how good God is and how much he can restore us. So John's gospel finishes by telling the story. The disciples are out fishing. Jesus shows up. And just like normal, they don't catch any fish except but with Jesus, all right? So if, you, if you're hungry for fish, just follow Jesus, all right? But the story goes like this, John 21, when they, had, gone, when they, had, when they uh, had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Cedar, uh, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Notice, notice how many times he says love. There's some back and forth with the word love, and I want, you to, I want you to focus on those really quick. Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. And Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? All right. Three times Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? And Peter answers, you know that I love you. He answered every time. So it's a pretty cut and dry story, right? Well, your New Testament, the New Testament that we all read is written in Greek. And so it's, it's all the Greek language, and we got different translations of the Bible. We got NLT, we got NIV. This is NIV right here, but there's all different kinds of translations. But they're all translations because it originally was written in Greek. But the Greek language has four words for the word love. We have one word love. I love my cat, and I love my spouse. Come on, we need better words, man. We need more words, you know what I'm saying? I don't love my cat the same way I love my spouse, but thanks to the Greek people, they've got more encompassing words for the word love. They got four. Uh, let me just describe them really quick. Uh, storge is natural affection, like, like that felt by, uh, by a parent for their kids or for their brother or their sister. Um, eros is physical attraction, which is like just physical cravings, sexual pleasure, chocolate, Easter bunny candy. Come on. That's, that's, I love Easter candy. It's eros. That's that. I, I desire it. I desire it. And then there's phileo. Uh, maybe you've heard of that. Uh, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. This is, this is like friendship. This is, uh, uh, I love you like a brother. Phileo. Pay attention to that one. And then there's agape, unconditional love, God kind of love, sacrificial love, the kind of love Peter claimed to have for Jesus but didn't know he didn't have. And that's where we pick this up because Peter responds to every time Jesus asks him, Jesus asks him, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me unconditionally? And Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know I phileo you. He actually used different words to, describe, to, to respond. We read the same word love, but Jesus is essentially asking, 
Peter, do you love me unconditionally? Do you love me with your life? And Peter, with his failure fresh in his mind, says, you know I love you like a brother. And you know what Jesus says? Feed my lambs. I can still use you. I still plan on using you. I still can use, I want to use you. Even though you don't love me the way that you thought you did, I can still use. And then the third time Jesus responds, Peter, do you phileo me? You know what I see in that? I see the Christmas story, how, how Jesus came down to be with us and God pursued us in that way. I see Jesus coming and say, I'll meet you where you're at, Peter. I can use you right where you're at. Feed my lambs. In fact, uh, the, the local church now would never pick Peter to preach the first sermon, but 50 days after the resurrection, Jesus picks Peter to give the first sermon. Thousands of people get saved. Nowadays, we'd never pick Peter. He's a failure. But God continues to use, his, to use failures. And maybe some of us feel like I failed. I've walked away from him. I am not as close to God as I used to be. I've never been very close to God. I feel like God's here. I'm here. So we're separate. And God reaches down his hand and said, no, I got you. I, got, I know you don't. I know you can't. Do you think God understands that we can't love him in the immeasurable way that he loves us? Yes, he does know, but he's willing to meet us there. Jesus' appearance to Peter reminds us, Jesus won't give up on you. No matter where you're at, he's not gonna give up on you. He's continuing to pursue you. He's calling out to you, even with, you can still taste the failure in your mouth. It's still on your mind. It's still in your heart. But Jesus is saying, no, I'm coming for you. I won't give up on you. Jesus won't give up on you. So love him. Jesus won't give up on you. So love him. Jesus had the whole world to appear to, but he went to the hurting. He went to the doubting. And he went to those who failed. Come on, let's celebrate the good news that Jesus comes to meet us where we are. And even though we're not perfect, never can be, God meets us there and he restores us in our failure. And he reaches out to us when we feel at our lowest, when we're at our most brokenhearted, when we're at our, uh, our biggest failure. And when we have all these doubts swirling around in our hearts and our minds, Jesus said, it's all right, I'm coming for you. Go ahead, put your hand there. Go ahead. Peter, do you love me? Oh, I love you. Feed my lambs. It's amazing to me. He isn't far away. He isn't bothered. He won't give up. God will never stop searching for you. Let me say it this way. He's still making appearances today. He hasn't stopped making appearances. It's not over. It's not over. He's still making appearances so look for him. So reach out to him. So love him. In fact, the very first story in the Bible, Adam and Eve sin by eating of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 3, it says, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God. He was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They hid from him. This is, the, this is the place in human history where shame and rejection comes into our heart. But watch what happens. The Lord God called out to them. Where are you? Where are you? You, you think God didn't know where they were? He knew. He was calling out to them the same way he calls out to us. Where are you? I know you're ashamed. I know you're trying to hide from me. I know you're trying to keep me at an arm's length. Where are you? Where are you? He's still searching for us from the very first story in the Bible to one of the very last. Uh, even when they hid, God called out to them. And that's the question God is asking you today. And that's the question we're going to answer today is where are you? Where are you spiritually? Where are you spiritually? God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. He has more for you and he's knocking right now. This is the very first story, but look at the very last book of the Bible. Revelation 3. Look, I stand at the door and I knock if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. It's like bookends. This is the whole picture. God is searching for us. He's looking for us. He's coming for us. The very first story in the Bible to the very last, God is searching for people who feel far from him, who feel far from him. This is the true picture of God. He takes the initiative. He comes to us. He comes to you. 
He's still making more appearances and I pray that today he would make another one. Even if God feels a thousand steps away, he'll take 999 and stand at the door of your heart. All you need to do is open up to him. I'm living proof of that. Just open your life up to him. Just one foot in front of the other. Okay, God, okay. He comes all the way and all we do is open up to him and he'll be there for you. That's what Jesus said. If you open your heart's door, I will come in. The reason he wants to come in is not just to save. He wants to have fellowship with you. He wants to be our friend. We are friends of God because God is still making appearances. I pray that you would open your heart's door today. And this is normally the time where I would tell you to bow your heads and close your eyes, but don't. We're gonna do things a little differently today. Like I said, it's a special day. You know, it's the one day I got everybody who, who considers Lifeline Church home or at least, you know, friends of home. And so what I'd love to do is we'll take a little spiritual survey together. It's at the bottom of the back here. And I'd love for every single person, every person, all dream teamers, all lifeline people, everybody in the sound booth, I'm talking to everybody. Go ahead and take this out for me, please, if you would. I'm just asking nicely, <laughs> please. We went through a lot of energy here and I'd love it if you would do this. And all we want is your honest response. Where are you spiritually? So this is a sacred moment. All team members, let's try to be still and, 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 and respect others as we're taking personal spiritual inventory. Let me explain like the different, the different options we can do here. It's just this, this, the question is, where are you spiritually? And so there's A, B, C, and D. A represents, I'm already a believer. If you would say, I'm certain that I'm a Christian. I've made Jesus the Lord of my life. I know him intimately. I'm in a real relationship with Jesus. Then you go ahead and check A. That's a perfectly good answer. Say I, A is I'm already a Christian. Now, if you'd say this B right here, I'm ready to begin a relationship with Jesus. I would add to that, I'm ready to come back to Jesus. If you'd say I'm, I'm ready to know God intimately, I'm ready to come back to an intimate relationship with him. I want to receive what Jesus did for me, a real relationship with God. Then you check B. That means I'm believing today. I need a fresh beginning. Check B. I'm beginning a real relationship with God. And then there's C for all the Thomases out there. All right, I get you. I see you. I love you. And I love being a church that welcomes C people. But C means I'm still considering. Like I need to see a little more. Like I, I get it. You're all very excited about this. And I'm not opposed, but I'm still considering. If that's you, then that's just, just be honest. Then say, that's me, that's where I'm at. I'd like to consider more, I'd like to check it out. I'd appreciate you checking C. And then this last one, D, I don't ever intend. You would think I'd leave that one off, <laughs> but this is an honest spiritual survey. Like if you're here, you got dragged here, you're here to appease mom and dad and no one's gonna come around and look at yours you're just gonna drop it in the bucket as you leave, right? No one's looking at you. But I'm just asking for honesty. Like if that's you, we'll just be praying for you, that's all. We're not gonna do anything, we're not gonna, but I would love for you to just be honest with yourself and say, that's where I'm at. I'm good with my life. I'm gonna live my life my way. And that's what I wanna do. And it means I don't ever intend to make this decision. So for the next couple moments, I'm gonna actually step off the platform I don't want to give you a chance to just fill this out. Just another moment. Go ahead and do that. And when you're done, you can just bow your head and we'll, we'll pray out. Go ahead and do that now. As you finish, we'll just stay in an attitude of prayer right here. Lord, thank you. Thank you for searching for us. Thank you for pursuing us in our doubts, in our brokenheartedness, in our disappointment. 
in our failure, Lord, you continue to pursue us. Thank you. I pray for open hearts, open ears. I pray that you'll give everyone here the courage to open that door and experience that real life. So now, in a, in a more reverent tone, if you would bow your heads with me. If you did check B, then it's time for us to pray a prayer together. And the way we like to do it here at Lifeline, we like to pray as a family all together. And so if you're, if you're a B, and I'd like for you to repeat this prayer after me and everybody, if you'd like to join in, nobody praying alone today, just repeat this right after me. Say, dear God, I need you. I need a real relationship with you. Today I open the door. I'm letting you into my life. Forgive me for living my life my way. Today I invite Jesus to be the Lord of my life. Jesus, I want to know you. Be the Lord of my life. I believe you rose from the dead. And today I put my faith in you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and make me new. In Jesus' name, amen.